It's showtime for total solar eclipse watchers. Well, lots of excitement is building for the solar eclipse that will be happening on Friday morning. It's a question that's mobilized thousands. Where best to view the eclipse? The only two places that it will cross land are the Faroe Islands and Svalbard, which is up truly in the Arctic. A once in a generation spectacle that's drawn a crowd from around the world. And all eyes are on the weather forecast as we need clear skies to be able to view it. For so many eclipse chasers, it's about so much more than the visual spectacle. Here we were, a stone's throw from the North Pole following photographer Ruben Krabbe on his quest to capture a mind-bending photo of a skier in front of a solar eclipse. Visible from only two places, the pursuit for snow had dragged us as far north as we could go for an event that was only going to last two and a half minutes. It's not stupid, but it's such a, it's a difficult situation to put yourself in. Like, it's the most extreme you can get. Coming this far north in the middle of winter to see an eclipse seemed like absolutely absurd. <laughs> Honestly, I thought it was one of the stupider things ever. Like the chances of it being clear, I don't know what the odds are, but they gotta be like insanely low. He's like, oh, if you look at my computer, you can see these different settings for these different pictures with all these eclipses that have happened all over the world of action sports and, and I'm like, like what? Like, let's go skiing, dude. It was no secret why Brody, Chris, and Cody had come on the trip. They wanted to ski. That left me caught in the middle with the task of trying to squeeze two very different books onto the same page. If I get to live a full life, there's still only going to be three chances in my lifetime to try to chase a photograph like this. And who's to say I get those chances or that it's not cloudy there? The plan was to set up a remote base camp and explore the mountains while scouting for a location for Ruben's elusive photo. The odds of success were extremely slim, but if uncertainty is the first ingredient of any good adventure, then we had it in spades. Before we ventured anywhere, we needed to understand something of the locals. At over half a ton and a true apex predator, the cute polar bear that we all hoped to see was actually not that cuddly. This is the part that Steve explained super well, so I'm able to do this part, but I have no idea about the shooting part. It was borderline morally objectionable for me, because like, I don't think I would shoot a polar bear that was running toward me. And I don't know what I would do if, I, if, if there was a polar bear running toward you. I really want to see the polar bear like from a nice distance, you know? I think that'd be nice. Whoa, that was stressful. But it was really fun shooting a gun for my first time. I really am relying on the fact that A, we have guides that are much better at this sort of thing, and B, I can run faster than at least most of the people. Somehow everyone managed to hit the target, making our guide Steve feel safe enough to head out on a warm-up mission to an abandoned Russian town that he wanted to show us. It was an opportunity to test the sea ice and explore some skiing before our extended base camp in the lead up to the eclipse. We haven't actually skied yet. We almost put our ski boots on, but then we found out there were polar bears. So now we're looking at a polar bear. He's, he's surprisingly yellow. I was expecting him to be more white. He is the cutest man-eating predator that weighs 3,000 pounds I've ever seen. Look at this, look right now, look right now, Cody. Yeah, yeah, this, what is, it's like a little, he's, he's playing, around. He's playing on like an ice cube. This is so cool, dude. He turned out to be a she, and on the list of cool things to see, the polar bear was right up there. 
It was puzzling, though, that she wasn't as interested in watching our first ascent as she was in finding a seal under the ice. That polar bear's out there somewhere. He is out there, dude. At one time, a Russian coal mining town, Pyramiden was home to over 1,000 men, women, and children. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the mine closed and overnight the people left. And if you're wondering why Russia has a presence in a Norwegian territory, let's just say it's complicated. Now we're in an abandoned Russian town. I just met like the raddest Russian dude ever. But uh, this is different, I would say. Pyramiden, I like its status of a ghost town, yeah, because it is a ghost town. Don't let the coat deceive you. Sasha's friends in St. Petersburg call him a fake Russian since he doesn't drink vodka. Instead, he holds it down with the northernmost statue of Lenin, unlocking vacant buildings for tourists that find themselves here. Despite how eerie it is, Pyramiden has a remote beauty that I could see being an attraction. But for Sasha, there are other upsides too. Pyramiden is the only place in the world where I have my own room. You're the best guy in Pyramiden. I'm the only guy in Pyramiden. I cannot be the best or the worst. <laughs> I do hope so that you will have a chance to see the eclipse, but be careful because Svalbard is foggy and cloudy. When you see cloudy weather, it's ordinary weather for Svalbard. When you see the sun, it means that you are lucky to see the sun. So good luck to you guys. Stepping back into the present, if what Sasha said was true, well, we were lucky to have the sunshine. We wanted to make the most of it, as it was a rare opportunity to ski without considering the eclipse. There were still a few kinks that needed to be worked out though. I'm just taking mine off my feet right now because I had them on the wrong feet. Ah! Experience in extreme conditions wasn't exactly this crew's forte, which is why I brought cameraman Bjarni Salen along. As visionary steep skier Andreas Franson's main expedition partner, Together, they have logged first descents in some of the most intimidating mountain ranges on Earth. Can you feel the altitude at all? Yeah. Like always. <laughs> to say Bjarni was well-versed in the art of suffering was an understatement, but no one was prepared for our first obstacle. Arctic puddles right now. The last thing you would expect to happen in the Arctic happened when climate change paid us a visit. It rained. We had prepared for the cold and for frostbite, but not for this. Surprise, surprise. It started raining in the middle of uh, March in the Arctic. I think something's wrong. Uh, it's been raining for now, I would say, about 18 hours. Uh, this is some serious hazard management. Uh, we need to think about what we want to do in terms of pushing it and getting out there um, and destroying a lot of equipment and, you know, the trip. On a reconnaissance mission three weeks earlier, Steve had a close encounter when his snowmobile broke through the ice and sank in a foot of water. When we learned the story, we had to question the logic in hiring a computer science dropout from Oxford, England to lead us into the frozen wilds. It's very difficult to eat without a spoon. I once forgot my spoon and I used a wrench from my uh, snowmobile toolkit and that wrench stuck to the inside of my mouth because it was, I was there on a glacier, you know. <laughs> With the wrench in my mouth, it's frozen in my mouth. You have to bring spoons. <laughs> 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 
After a helicopter evacuation and wet feet, the crisis was averted and Steve was apparently wiser for both those experiences. So the weather the day before this happened was pretty much identical to how it is right now. 100 percent And we so were gonna leave tomorrow. This is worse. That's yeah. great. Okay. So that's why we're delaying. That's yeah. why. Uh, reaching a peak, I think. And uh, first of all, the top of the town went out, probably Nebian first, then the middle of the town. And apparently it's worked its way down to the university, and now all the street lights are out too. And we haven't had this all year. So, welcome, Salomon. How is it, Svalbard? Ruben's like the artistic genius, where he's like thinking about his shot kind of all the time, but a lot of like real life stuff just flies right over his head, you know. Ruben is like possibly one of the most awkward guys I've ever been in the mountains with, but I think it's because he's like a borderline genius. It was disturbing to think that our Pied Piper was a 24 year old with peach fuzz for a beard whose covert plan seemed to be adding to his exotic yoga pose series. Growing up east of the Rocky Mountains, Reuben picked up his father's old Pentax at 15, learning the craft shooting friends before making a splash at 21 with an outrageously awesome photo of the Northern Lights. This idea of chasing an eclipse is basically just the next extent of that same concept. He's like the dweeb that found out about this eclipse that wanted to follow it all the way to the North Pole. You need a special kind of person to be so focused on something like this. And Ruben has this focus more than anybody else. That's what gets you an eclipse shot, is being able to dream that big. Like, that's a huge amount of imagination, and not everybody can do that. This is probably the one time in my lifetime that I get to try to shoot this photo. It's a bit of pressure, eh? Yeah, what if it doesn't work out? <laughs> the most gear I've ever seen. However, I mean, it makes sense. We're gonna be living nicely for a week or two, so I'm stoked on it. But it's a lot of stuff, especially a lot of stuff to pull behind snowmobiles over like that much ice. Over the rooftops into the sea. Along Psych, packed up for a huge adventure. It's gonna be awesome, stoked. Don't ask me, we have to get there first. GPS track is here and continues uh, into that. So I guess we're gonna have to find another route to our base camp today. But I thought computers were always right. Computers are always right, but computers, yeah, they die from water too. <laughs> <laughs> Sea ice wasn't Steve's problem last time. It was the river valleys, and we had to cross one to make it to the glacier on the other side. Yeah, this is what we were worried about after the storm. Probably like four centimeters. We've had some freezing, we had cold temperatures last night, so I feel pretty confident about it. It's good. sleds across and good to go. Stan suffered nothing more than dented pride and a purple butt cheek while giving us a sobering dose of reality at how quickly things can go wrong. After seven hours, we made it to our glacier camp for the lead up to the eclipse. With 12 days of food, two generators, and believe it or not, a heater for the mess tent, we thought we were the cat's meow. <laughs>
perched at the head of the fridge off Bryn Glacier, the views were pretty darn spectacular. Except Bjarni spoiled my epic drone shots by stamping out a huge penis on the glacier. It was difficult to stay mad at Bjarni though, because it was great to see him back in the mountains after the recent death of two of his close friends in an avalanche. The 29th of September last year, 2014, when the accident happened in Chile, it was a bit of a shock. Because um, I lost my two best friends, Andreas and JP, and after that I've been taking a bit of a step back because I wanted to reflect on life and everything I've been doing. Andreas was a friend to everyone on the team, but he was a brother to Biani. And while this trip meant different things to everybody, for Biani it was a big step towards rekindling the passion that he and Andreas shared. This is kind of Biani's first trip back in the mountains since Andreas' accident. And uh, I can't imagine how hard that would be, but he's just like, he's so stoked that he's back. This is how nice, nice it is to be in Svalbard. Sometimes I cry, but I didn't want to cry too much because it was so cold, so I know my, it would just freeze. <laughs> so I just had to stop myself crying a bit. But that was one moment when it's, something is beautiful and you find peace, you know? And then I know Andreas would be like, so stoked to be there. I love my job. Well, he's had a lot of tragedy in the last couple of years like a lot of close friends that passed away and he could have walked away for sure. It's worth spending time with people out here and we're not doing the most crazy lines, you know? We're, we're here and shooting some beautiful skiing in a beautiful environment and you wouldn't be able to experience that if you weren't here to ski. Twice a day we made it it Keeps the devil from my door So far, the scouting was working out great for the athletes, but finding a spot for Ruben where the sun, moon, skiers and camera would align was easier said than done. Day two on the glacier and uh, yeah, we're going for it. We got some cool spines behind us that might work for the eclipse and we kind of just got to go up and get a feel for the snow. We've talked in circles for two days now and so it'll be good to just see if we can even ski any of this stuff. I can't say that the snow is awesome or that it's very warm up here but Windy too, if you didn't notice. Why am I yelling? What are we yelling about? Even if this location had have worked, standing in the wind for two hours during the eclipse wasn't realistic. Someone was going to get frostbite. And while the cold took its toll on the skiers, the pressure was beginning to show on Ruben. The eclipse team, yay! I think I've been a bit too cryptic with uh, the ideas that I have. Like I had four or five different ideas of what I wanted to do or could do. And now it's boiling down to we just want to find one place to make one shot. So the really, really difficult one, which I don't really expect to try, would be getting a person inside the surface of the sun. And the surface of the sun would be golden color and everything else would be pitch black. To do that shot, we need really clear skies and the lenses need to be like at least a kilometer and a half away from the action. Svalbard might have been the only place in the world that we were going to see the eclipse, but it was also a veritable skier's buffet. A landmass that was once part of Pangaea 200 million years ago, it is now a remnant from the bare knuckle fist fight with the Earth's forces that bullied it from below the equator to where it is now at 80 degrees north. I've never seen a place that is as stacked with as many coulars as here. Like, it's just left and right coular town. I expected the terrain in Svalbard to be cool, but not like the sickest terrain in the world. But we show up and we see walls of coulars just stacked. Looks like all the rock at one point just 
turned vertical. Like it was the whole earth went upward. I could come back here every year and never be bored. I'm sure there's so much to explore here. Before the trip, Steve emailed me a single photo that I posted to our Facebook group. It was the cheese that lured the skiers into Ruben's little trap and they had taken the bait. But due to conditions and scouting for the eclipse, the reward was proving difficult to reach. That alone was enough reason for the skiers to be psyched to come here. On a personal level, that was the one objective, was to go ski that face. Skiing, the eclipse, all our plans were put on hold when the Arctic slapped us with snow and winds that threatened to bury camp. This is when winter camping gets really fun, because, uh, yeah, it's kind of survival-based. Chris was right. It was survival-based. Yet he had very different ideas about what it takes to survive. You know, when you're camping, everything's a little bit more difficult, and definitely going to the bathroom is like a super big pain in the ass. I mean, there was many other things that we could have improved with the camp, but the toilet was magnificent. It was uh, the WC of the century. Finishing touches on the new throne. Oh, yeah. It was hard to deny that Chris had done us all a favor. When it's minus 20 and there's snow blowing up your wazoo, it doesn't do much for morale. No amount of coffee and a comfy throne could top the enthusiasm, though, when the weather cleared to deliver us a shot at the crown jewel. The Facebook wall. Dun, dun, dun. We got one photo. And we had this little Facebook group with the people on this trip. So the one picture that we had posted to our Facebook group was just of this one mountain with these like craggy summits. Came and visited it earlier in the trip, but uh, the snow didn't look good and the snow actually looks pretty shreddable right now. That's wild, man. After like seeing pictures of this wall and coming all the way to Svalbard for it and now being on top of it. It's a beautiful, beautiful face. Like if it was in Alaska, you'd go ride that face. If it was anywhere, you'd go ride that face. So it was pretty much the single most anticipated ski run that we had. You know, it was one of the best runs of the trip. That zone has some of the coolest couloirs, some of the raddest features, some of the longest vert that we found and pretty much dumps you almost into the ocean. It's a pretty incredible spot. Oh, that was fun! That was so fun! It was an apex of the trip. It was like, okay, like this once again is like a really hard thing to make happen and we just nailed it. And like now we have the next big thing to look forward to. The eclipse was beginning to feel like the day before Christmas, except the neurotic in-laws and aunt that you don't like were coming for dinner. It was going to be awesome, but it was also going to be stressful. To be truthful, I wouldn't really say I'm stoked right now because I just don't see anywhere that I want to be set up. And it just feels like there's so little amount of time left that I want to sort of key in on something and be like, okay, hey, yes, I see that, I see a photo. and I. I don't right now, so that's feeling really, really tough. More options, more scouting, more making athletes angry. 
I'm just hoping it's here and done with. I mean, it'll be really cool to see it, but there's been so much built up about it. It's kind of like, okay, come on, just get it over with. And now it's like, whatever, 20 hours away, less. Yeah. down my expectations to trying to get one or two really beautiful photos and that's really what I wanted to come away with from this trip but I didn't want to predict anything too much. Well we're gearing up for the eclipse. It's the eclipse day coldest day yet. It's minus 20 out there. Howling winds from the north, which really warm things up. But the good news and the most incredible thing ever is that it's clear, so we might actually get to see this eclipse. Whether we ski in front of it, who knows, but I think we're going to be pretty lucky if we just get to see this thing. I think we're pretty lucky if we don't lose any coast today. <laughs> Chaos, an hour and a half disappeared really quickly and the eclipse is starting, so now I'm panicking a little bit already. We had to come to this frigid island to watch the moon pass in front of the sun. And as stupid as that sounds, it's pretty awesome, actually. My poor heart, nine, you've got like one minute. I hope I didn't fuck that up. exact photo that we said was so hard to pull off and such a low chance of success. And there's this drawing. Yeah, we got this photo. We got the impossible shot. The eclipse really blew my mind. I can't believe it, but it worked. It totally worked out. That was pretty crazy. Like, that's definitely something I'll remember for the rest of my life. To see it was a big, beautiful shivers down his spine. It was just magical. Like, it is one of the most, like, just 
insane things you will ever see. It was the most magical experience. I had no idea it was going to be like that. It felt like a sci-fi movie. It felt like something completely alien. Having seen it happen and through the lens and knowing that you were getting those photos that you were dream dreaming of was one of the most euphoric experiences I've had ever.